then tried to do was give it some validity by continuing it all through the morning. I mean, these people are wicked. It's showing you the wickedness of these people here, you know, and it's, um, it's clear for all to see. So, Leon, go from... Um, so they, 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 they didn't have any authority to inflict any capital punishment because they was under Roman rule. And this is why now we see the religious leaders hurrying him to Pontius Pilate. So as we go into that, um, verses 3 to 10, Leon. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was resentful and brought back the third pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And that they said, what is that to us? You see it, you see to it. And then he threw down the pieces of silver at the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest looked at the silver pieces and said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of the blood and they consulted together and brought them brought with them the potters filled and buried strangers in therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day then was filled what was spoken to jeremiah the prophet saying and they took the 30 pieces of silver and the value of him who was pierced whom they of the children of israel's Christ and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. Thank you. That's three to ten, yeah. Thank you. Poor so we see, so we see, thanks, Leon. Uh, so we see that, uh, and we had this discussion in our Bible study the other night. We, we had, we spent a lot of time on Judas. It was really, really, it was really, really powerful, actually. Um, it's probably one of the best Bible studies I've been in in Faithful because it's very interactive and we could all see and we had to ask ourselves a few questions you know because it says Judas was remorseful it says it doesn't it Judas was remorseful about betraying Jesus but what we also needed to understand that he wasn't repenting there was no repentance see even though he knew exactly what he did i have sinned by betraying innocent blood jesus was more sorry for the result of his sin we've all been there when we've done something wrong feeling sorry for ourselves rather than anything else and there's there are two kinds of repentance there's godly repentance that leads to salvation but there is also a shallow repentance that produces death. And if we go to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10, can someone read that out for us, please? 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. Right, it says... 2 Corinthians, yes, yeah, second. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Amen. We see two types of repentance. The repentance of Judas was remorseful rather than godly contrition. He was sorry for the effects which his crime brought on himself. Been there many a times. But he was not willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. So when we look at Many people in the world, and I'll particularly draw to uh, you know people that don't know Christ. They're sorry for their actions, but they're not acknowledging Jesus because he's the father of our repentance. So pretty much, you know, we've got to look at that, those, that type of repentance, if we're not or don't know God, means nothing. It's pretty much what this scripture is saying, because it won't lead to what? Salvation. Amen. So we're, we're kind of like really lucky here, aren't we? That, you know, you know, that we've got this, this rebound back into the realm, you know. And I think about this because, you know, I love Wade. Do you know what I mean? Wade comes on. He always tells us honestly about, you know, I mean, I've known Wade for a long time. 
And he comes in and he always tells us honestly, I always think about Wade with this with, with this particular scripture. Because I think, wow, back in the game. Because I, you know, you know, but then we have to then look at two things. Is repentance just saying sorry? Because when we look at what the Bible says, it says that we also need to turn away from those things. So that's a question that, that has to go deep in our hearts. It has to go deep in our hearts because then we can go into all sorts of connotations with that particular scripture. And that's a, that's a study within itself. But I, I, I thought, you know, it's important for us to mention that. Do you know what I mean? Because he was not willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. There have been many times when I've not been willing to acknowledge Jesus Christ as my Lord and Saviour. What's the difference between me and Judas? Today I am. Hallelujah. Thank God. And in desperation, the traitor threw the 30 pieces of silver inside the temple where only the priest could go. So let's look at that. He threw the money where only the priest could go. Then he went out and then committed suicide. And we touched on this in Acts 1.18. It recorded that Jesus hanged himself on a tree, the rope of the branch, and broke his body, which held that a perceived, causing it to be disemboweled. So basically, all very gory, horrific. You can imagine. You see, the chief priests were too spiritual to put money into the temple because it was the price of blood. Yet they were the guilty ones who had paid that money to have the Messiah turned over to them. And that didn't seem to bother them. And as the Lord had said to them, he said, they made the outside of the cup clean. But inside, it was full of deceit, treachery and murder. Their decision to use that money to buy that potter's field were unclean. Little did they realise how many Gentile hordes would invade that land and splatter their streets with blood. And many of those Gentiles invaded that place. The most satisfactory explanation is that Matthew actually cities the prophet of Zechariah, but labels the citation from Jeremiah because that prophet stood at the head of the prophetic role he used according to the ancient order, preserved in scripture in Hebrews. Wade, 11 to 14, please. Matthew 27. Wade. However, I have a saying read from Matthew 11, uh, 27, 11 onwards. And Jesus. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I just had to alert you there. I just, I just picked up on that. Okay, bless. Thanks, Leon. Colors today. God bless you. And Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hear thou not how many things they witness against you? And he answered him, To never a word. In so much that the governor marveled greatly. Amen. Amen. Three things to look at here. Jesus first appears before before Pilate. They knew when they brought him to Pilate that they would be pressed with three political charges against him as recorded in Luke 23 too. That one, he was a revolutionary and therefore represented a potential threat to the peace of the empire. The second one they presented, he urged people not to pay their taxes, which again would have went against um, um, Roman jurisdictions at that time and therefore was undermining prosperity of the empire. Three, he claimed to be a king 
and therefore was a threat to the power and position of emperor. But here in Matthew's Gospel, we hear Pilate interrogating him on the third charge. The governor asked him if he was king of the Jews, and Jesus naturally answered that he was. This brought forth abuse and slander from the chief priests and elders. But what puzzled Pilate was that the defendant remained silent. He would not dignify either one of these charges with an answer. Probably never before in his experience had the governor seen anyone remain silent under attack. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used and produced against you in evidence. <laughs> this must have been this must have been where they come from, eh? <laughs> Jesus gave us an answer here. <laughs> and I looked at this scripture and I thought, wow, there's something about this. <laughs> Innocent until proven guilty. <laughs> Sometimes Jesus showed us it's just best to remain silent even when you've been accused of things that you never did. There's no need to go da 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 or da 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 or da 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 Just remain silent. I thought that was absolutely brilliant because there's many, many, many times that I just wish that I just remain silent. And it was my big mouth that caused me more problems that I could have ever done and said things that I wish I never said, and I couldn't take it back. So there's a really, really, really big lesson in three chapters of scripture there. Carry on, Wade, 15 to 23. Now at the feast, the governor was wont to re, was want to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said unto him, saying, have you nothing to do with that? Just have nothing to do with that just man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, whether of the two of the twain will you that I release unto you? They said Barabbas. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out all the more, saying, Let him be crucified. Wow. Uh, the, the more I read this or watch this on the Passion or whatever Jesus story that I look at, there's always something in my spirit that cries out, please say Jesus. <laughs> if that happened, the Messianic prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled, would it? And it was, it was customary for the Roman authorities to pacify the Jews at the time. But we see the hearts of the Jews. We also talked about this, about the fickleness. Three days ago, you know, they was in the town. These were the people uh, that were laying palms along the road, you know, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, King, 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 you know, um, throwing their, 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 their materials and their coats and their, and their clothing down along the floor whilst the donkey's going through the town. Now, here the same people are saying, crucify him. This is our heart condition. And we need to take note from this because it's easy for us to, you know, I always have to look at the Pharisee in me. I always say this to myself. It's important, you know, that I can really, you know, get into what the Pharisee is, what the chief priest, what they're all about. But, you know, this is me. This is me. And when we look at this, this evident, this convict Barabbas, you know, a Jew had been guilty of insurrection, murder. He was a rebel. He was against Roman rule. He, um, he had, um, 
yeah, popular traits. He, 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 he's, he's, um, his mission was to take down the, 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 the Roman Empire. You know, he, he recruited uh, murderers, you know, to, to fight against the system. And, um, you know, when we look back and we go back to uh, the, the, the Jews, they were looking for this type of uh, messiah to overturn Roman rule. And here we see a lot of the disappointment around why they couldn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. This lowly carpenter, you know, you know, that had this grace, that had this humility, had this love, and, you, you know, operated in a completely different way to how they perceived that things should be done in overturning that oppression that they was under. So when Pilate gave the people their choice between Jesus and Barabbas, they cried, Barabbas. And it still never ceases to, to amaze me that they did that. And the proceedings were temporarily interrupted by the arrival of Pilate's wife. You see, she was urging her husband to adopt a hands-off policy. And she said that she had a very disturbing dream. Behind the scenes, the chief priests and the elders were passing the word for the release of Barabbas and the death of Jesus. And so when Pilate asked... When Pilate asked the people again which one they wanted to be freed, they cried for Barabbas, caught in the web of his own decisive indecisiveness. Pilate asked, what then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they were unanimous. They were unanimous by saying crucify him. Pilate's still confused. You can clearly see that Pilate didn't want nothing to do with this. Why crucify him? What crime has he committed? It was too late to plead that calm logic. Mob hysteria had taken over. A cry rang out. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify. Leon, verse 24 to 26, please. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And then he released Barbus into them. And when he had scourged Jesus and delivered him to be crucified, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the panatorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put on his head and the reed, and the reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, How a king of Jews? And then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took, a they took the robe off him and put his own clothes on him and led him away to be crucified. Now, as they came out, they found a man of Serene, someone by the name of they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to a place called Galophia, and, they, and it is said to... Let me read that again. And when they had come to a place called Glophia, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mangled with gold to drink. But when he had tasted it, he would not drink. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Liam. Okay, great. So we've got the fatal decision there. You know, Pilate washed his hands, but unfortunately, by water, will never clear Pilate from the guilt 
that were involved in history's gravest miscarriage of justice. Sometimes too, we can wash our hands and think that little simple little rituals are gonna cleanse us like some of the world does think, but it's only that repentant heart. The crowd was too frenzied to worry about guilt. They were willing to, to bear blame that his blood be on us and on our children. Verse 25, you see, God heard that self-imposed curse and ratified it in heaven. Even then, the people of Israel have staggered from ghetto to massacre, from concentration camps to gas chambers, suffering under awful guilt of blood of their rejected Messiah. They still face fearsome times of trouble. The times of Jacob's trouble, those seven years of tribulation described in Matthew 24, Revelation 6, 19, that the curse will not be removed until the acknowledgement of the rejected Jesus as the Messiah King. The Pilate released Barabbas to the crowd and the spirit of Bar Barabbas has dominated the world scene ever since. The spirit of Barabbas, the murderer, is still enthroned and the righteous king is still rejected. This was his custom and it's condemned. And we see, we see it in our world today. We see it in people's hearts today. That bearing shame and scoffing rude as it works on in verse 27 to, to 27, the pilot soldiers took Jesus into the governor's place and they gathered the whole battalion before him, probably several hundred men. And what followed is hard to imagine. You know, the best description probably you've ever seen on this is, is the passion of Christ. And it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal. I don't even want to go into it. But what we need to go into is since scarlet is associated with sin in Isaiah 1.8, perhaps that robe pictures our sins being placed on Jesus so that God, the robe of righteousness, might be placed upon us, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. That they, they wove that crown of forms and pressed it down firmly on his head, his sacred head. But beyond their crude joke, we perceived that he wore a crown of forms, that he might wear our crown of glory. They mocked him. They beat him. They stripped him. They slapped him. They punched him. But what they didn't know was that the hand that held that reed in the hand that rules the world, it now holds the scepter of universal dominion. That nail scarred hand of Jesus. That Jesus wore a crown of thorns so that we might wear a crown of glory. Us today, that crown of thorns that was, that, that was crowned in his head so that we might wear a crown of glory today. And doesn't that feel good? Doesn't that feel good here? Just being able to talk about, you know, what happened there, that we here today are walking around, not even might, we are because of what he did. Because we are believers. And they knelt down before Jesus and addressed him as king of the Jews, not content with that, they spat in his face. And considered him who endured such hostility for sinners against himself. Finally, they put his own clothes back on and led him away to be crucified. And as Leon um, started with some of that, can Wade, can you go back to 32 to 44, the actual crucifixion? 32 to 44. As they were going out, 32 to 44. Correct. Yeah. As they were going out, they met a man and from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right hand 
one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Wow. So we look at this, um, Simon and Serene. What a privilege that must have been. You know, he carried this Lord's cross part of the way, as it says in John 19, 17. And the soldier ordered the name Simon to carry it. Simon was from Serene in North Africa. Some think he was a Jew. Others think he was a black man. Doesn't really matter who it was. But in some of the things that I've seen, you know, he, 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 was, he was quite clearly black. <laughs> <coughs> the important thing to note here is, is that he had a wonderful privilege of carrying that cross. The fact that his name is given and that Mark adds it and notes that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus indicates that he was known to his readers very likely became a believer in Christ after that. How could you not? <laughs> Outside the city was a place, and we knew this place, they called it Golgotha. This was in Hebrew. Um, its name was Calvary, the Latin equivalent, but the word meant skull or place of skull. And as we see this, prior to soldiers, you know, mocking him, you know, um, giving him vinegar to drink, you know, condemning him. And this was given to condemn criminals as a drug when when the Lord tasted it, that he would not drink it for him. It was necessary that he was bear the full load of man's sin with no impairment of his senses, with no alleviation of pain. Matthew restraints in describing that actually the crucifixion is noteworthy. He simply says that they were crucified. He does not indulge in dramatics or, or, or resorts to sensational journalism. He goes straight in. He simply states the fact that it's all yet eternal itself. And as the scriptures have predicted in Psalms 22, 18, the soldiers divided his lot. This is where we see the messianic prophecy being fulfilled. And they sat down and they watched him and they mocked him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. The exact words of subscription that verified on his cross, I and I, I. Also in the full four gospel, the king of the Jews, 1526 in Luke, this is the king of the Jews. 2338, John's description is, is most complete. Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. The chief priest protested that the title should not be a statement of fact, but mere claim of the accused. I mean, these people are wicked, as we know. And I can see the wickedness of man in this, the wickedness of me in this. And I can nothing but feel sorry. Feel sorry for, for sometimes that the way we are and the way we behave and the way we act and the way we, the way we are just human. And if the cross reveals God's love, it also reveals man's depravity. The crowd passes by jeered at the shepherd as he was dying for the sheep. That you would destroy the temple and build it three days. Save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. Here we have the language of rationalist unbelief. <laughs> Look at him, Jesus. Save yourself. The, the one who's done all the miracles. <laughs> scoffing mocking sometimes it's looked at in the church today unbelief this is why unbelief is a sin <clears throat> let's see we will believe let's see let us see you come down from the cross and then we'll believe you <laughs> you imagine it you know, you're preaching the gospel, you're preaching the gospel, and all they want to see is what they want to see. They can't see any deeper. In other words, remove the offense of the cross and we will believe. 
William both said they claimed that they would have believed if he had come down. Hmm. We believe Jesus because he stayed up. They claimed that they would believe if he came down. We believe Jesus because he stayed up. Oh, glory to God. <laughs> The chiefs, priests, scribes, and the elders joined the chorus. Look at these wicked people. They had it all coming in. With unintentional insight, they cried, he saved others, but he can't save himself. <laughs> they meant to taunt him in that song. We adapted the hymns of praise, but they mocked his claim to be saviour. They mocked his claim to be king. They mocked his claim to be king of Israel. They mocked his claim to be son of God, and they still do it today. Hallelujah. Unbelief is a sin. I'm ramming it home. And as we go into those three hours of darkness, we go into those three hours of darkness in verses 45 to 50. We look at from noon and until the afternoon of darkness. From noon until the afternoon of darkness. From noon until the afternoon, the darkness came all over the land. And about all three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Elil, Elil, Lema Shabakaki, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there had heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine and vinegar, put it on the staff. And offered it to Jesus. Offered it to Jesus. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Again, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split. And the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. And when the centurion and those who were with him, who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among those were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee. And we see in this that yet all the suffering and indignities which Jesus brought at the hands of men that were minor compared to what he now faced from moon until 3 p.m. There was darkness, not only in the land of Palestine, but in the holy soul as well. Jesus finished that work. That was necessary for man's de 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 redemption. And if we look at 3 p.m., Jesus cried out in that light, loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is found in Psalm 22, verse 3. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. It is because God is holy that he forsake his son during those three hours of darkness. Because God is holy, he cannot overlook sin. On the contrary, he must punish it. And although Lord Jesus had no sin of him yet, he took the guilt and the responsibility of our sin upon himself in those hours. And when God has judged, looked down and saw our sins being placed upon the sinless substitute, he withdrew. He withdrew from the son of his love. And while they heard Jesus cry, Eli, Eli, some of the bystanders there, he was calling for, he's saying he's calling for Elijah. Whether they actually confused the names or were simply mocking, it's not clear. But they were still taunting. And by using a long reed, the sponge was lifted up to his lips. 
judging from Psalm 69, 22, this was not intended as an act of mercy, but an added form of suffering. The general attitude was to wait to see if Elijah would come and would fulfill this role, which Jewish tradition assigned to him, that the coming of the aid of the righteous, but it was not the time for Elijah to come. Malachi 4, 5. It was time for Jesus to die so that the messianic prophecy could be fulfilled. And when he cried out with that loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. The loud cry demonstrated that he died in strength, not in weakness. He died in power and glory. Hallelujah. And even when you watch that film, you kind of like think, yeah, it's, it's, get it done. It's finished. You've had enough, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on. Rise again because we know you're coming back in power and glory. Get it done. It's like, it's like at that point in time, you kind of like have a sense of relief. Oh. oh. You know, my sin has been placed upon that cross. Hallelujah. I understand this today because I can really look to this for what it really is. Because I can see the greatest act in history. I can understand it because my heart is regenerated today. It's not just a, 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 a Christmas play or a nativity play or something that I learned in school or, or a story or a myth. It's actually now related to my heart. Hallelujah. And we got the pleasure that we can come together with the Bible and the gospel and we can talk about this stuff and experience that love. And I want to share with you today that no matter what you're going, Jesus bore it for you. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus because of what he'd done for you on that cross. He took it all away. The bloods, the cleansing of the blood of righteousness over each and every single one of us right now. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just give God some glory right now. Come on. It's not a sad state of affairs. Come on, let's lift up our voices and proclaim the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done for us. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, I'm not sad today. I'm not sad today. There were many times when I could be, you know, in that place and in that, even in that self-pity of thinking about poor me, poor me, poor me. I'm not sad today. I know what this represents. Hallelujah. Not just for me, but for you and for all mankind. Hallelujah. Glory to God that he laid down his life so that we may take it up again so that no one can take it away from me. He's laid his life. He's down for me and you. Hallelujah. That I have power through him in the mighty name of Jesus. That the veil's been torn. That strange event that took place in the temple, the heavy woven curtain that separated the two main rooms was torn by the unseen hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Done. Finish. In the book of Hebrews, we learn that the veil represented the body of Jesus. Rendering of the veil pictured him giving up his body in death. Hallelujah. And through his death, we have the boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The holy of holies. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we have access to you right now. That we have peace for you right now. That we have relationship with you right now. That you are in us right now through your spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. That we have the boldness to enter the holiness of blood. Because Jesus has given us a new living. He's consecrated us through the vow that is in his flesh. That now the humblest believer can enter the presence of God. Hallelujah. Any time, any day, any second, any minute any hour hallelujah glory to god in prayer and in praise but let us never forget that the privilege was purchased for us at a tremendous price the sacrificial death of jesus christ the death of god's son also produced tremendous upheaval in the natural realm 
Was there an empathy between an intimate creation and the creator? There was an earthquake which split great rocks and opened many tombs. Dead bodies got raised from the dead. The resurrection power. But notice, it was not until after Jesus rose from the dead that the occupants of these tombs were raised. And then they went to Jerusalem, where many of them saw them. That Christ is the first fruits of those who have died. 1 Corinthians 15, 12. He's the firstborn from the dead. Therefore, it's moral and it's necessary that he, the first to be rise in the power of the endless life, that the Bible shows us that whether these risen saints died again or went to heaven with the Lord Jesus, that Christ is the first fruits who died. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Wade, finish it to the end for us. The faithful woman, right through to Jesus is buried. And that's it. Take it up to 60, 61, please. So 55 to 61. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. <clears throat> Joseph, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. Amen. There we see faithful women. Special mention in verses 55 and 66, the women who had faithfully ministered to the Lord and had followed him all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem, Mary Magdalene. She was there and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. She was there too. The fearless devotion of these women were remarkable. They remind with Christ. And they reminded us of what faithfulness was all about right the way through to the end with the other disciples in their lives. We also see that Joseph of Arithmia, he was a rich man, a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin. He had not agreed with the decision of the council, but he was part of the council. He must have been outvoted. He was powerless. He didn't agree with what went on. But here we have still, you know, uh, an opportunity. He took this opportunity. He took this opportunity that even though he didn't agree with the decision of the council to deliver Jesus to Pilate, as it showed in Luke 23, 30, and if he had been a secret disciple up until this point, he now threw caution to the wind. Because boldly, we see the boldness coming upon him. He went to Pilate and asked for permission to bury his body. We must try and imagine what a surprise this would have been to Pilate. What a provocation to the Jews that a member of the Sanhedrin would probably take this stand for this crucified. There is real, there is real sense in which Joseph buried himself economically, socially, religiously. And when he buried the body of Jesus, this act separated him forever from the world that killed the Lord Jesus. You see, Joseph buried him. And, he, and we look at, you know, through centuries, Isaiah predicted that they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich in his death. Isaiah 53, 9, his enemies had no doubt plan to throw his body this is what they wanted to do they wanted to throw his body in the valley of him where if you look at um uh, where they were torturizing and and they were torturizing all the jews where they crucified them what they would do as soon as they were dead they'd lift them up and they just throw them in the fire and, jo and, and, and and joseph knew that this couldn't happen to our lord jesus so we see the messianic prophecy being fulfilled and as we go into the last chapter, you know, that Jesus is laid. That the guards are posted by the tomb. And the next day, the one after the, the preparation day, the chiefs and the Pharisees went to Pilate. 
Turner, he said, remain there for a while. And he was still alive. That deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So they gave the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that have been raised from the dead. I mean, these people are going on right to the end. That last deception will be worse than the first. Take guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard on it. The first day of the Passover was called the day of preparation. That was the day of crucifixion. The next day, these chief priests and the Pharisees, they were uneasy. They remembered what Jesus had said about rising again. And that must be prevented at all costs. That must have been in their minds because they knew the truth. And they went to Pilate and asked for a special guard to be placed on the tomb, fearing that it would happen, fearing that his resurrection would be worse than his claim to be Messiah and the Son of God. Pilate answered, you have the guard. Go your way. Make it secure as you know how, was the irony in Pilate's voice as he said. They tried hard. They did their best. They sealed the stone. They set watch. But their best security measures were just not good enough for our King Jesus. The precautions his enemies took to make that spectacle sure, sealing it, and stationing a guard only resulted in God's overruling plans of the wicked and offering undisputable proof of the king's resurrection. Bless you. Okay, guys, over to you now. We've got about 20 minutes. If you want to come and share back. I know it was a long, these last two chapters are long. Next week, there's only 18 chapters. Hallelujah. And we've done the whole book of Matthew. So God bless you. Thank you for, you know, listening. And um, it's been beautiful just sharing that with you guys. Leon's hands raised. So no more me. Over to you, Leon. Yeah, glory to God. Praise Jesus. Uh, yeah, it's powerful scripture. I mean, everything that was spoken. Thank you for either. Thank you.